You're listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Welcome to Habitat University. This podcast is your source for the science behind wildlife habitat management and is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. We're your host, Jared Brook. And I'm Adam Janke, and we're both biologists and extension wildlife specialists. If you're interested in wildlife habitat management or looking for ways to improve your property for wildlife, this is the podcast for you. So join us as we talk with researchers, managers, and landowners all about the latest research and the ins and outs of wildlife habitat management. And we are back with Habitat University, episode number two, if you're looking at it, but this is the third one we've recorded. We're not going to include that number two. That's right. Call it number two. We're not going to include that first introductory uh, episode. We hadn't even defined habitat yet. That's right. So, If you haven't listened to episode one yet, you're going to be really lost in this discussion as we go forward. So I would suggest that you pause this right now, go back to episode one, listen to it. We're going to define habitat and we're going to talk about all the ways that people misuse the term habitat and why habitat is a pancreston problem. And we're going to define pancreston. You're going to learn a new vocabulary word that you can just throw into your everyday conversations Uh, later on. So the listeners may remember that we took a pledge last time, right? And I have to admit that like this week I was talking to one of my graduate students and I heard myself violating the pledge and I felt terrible about it. Hey, but did you, you noticed it, right? Would you have noticed it before? Well, that's what I think we got to go for. I I think I, I, well, I promised in episode one that I was going to violate the pledge and, and I have. I did it with my student this week. I'm probably going to do it today on the podcast. I think it's just inevitable, but that's okay. We're going to notice it. We're going to do better and we're going to use habitat in the right context in the podcast, aren't we? Yeah. And we certainly understand that we're not perfect and no one's perfect and we're not always going to use it correctly. But I think the important point is that we are mindful of it and we understand it and we try to improve how we use it. That's right. That's right. So that's what we're going to launch from today in episode two. And we're just, let's just jump right in. Well, I, I, in this episode, in preparation for this, I was trying to con- convince you, Jared, that habitat management is the oldest profession known to man. And I don't think I've yet convinced you, and you can rebut this uh, here in a second, but, but let me first uh, preempt the argument with, with my, my point, which is as long as people have been eating animals, they have surely been trying to understand the way that those animals relate to the environment and manipulate those environments to their advantage to make them more efficient at eating those animals. And really, I think at the end of the day, that's what habitat management is. That, that's exactly what habitat management is, is understanding how animals relate to their environment and then manipulating that environment in order to create um, or enhance the resources those animals need. And that's the, to boil it down, that's all it is. And I don't know if I'm ready to say you're right, Adam, and maybe uh, we can have some listeners write in or call right. in and, and tell Especially us if they can Especially if think there's of... an anthropologist. Yes, we are not anthropologists for sure. We, we dabble a little bit in reading uh, historic books about anthropology and things like that, but definitely not an anthropologist. But what I would, what I would say, Adam, is that 100%, as long as man has been able to set a fire and as long as man has planted crops and things like that, they have been actively engaged in habitat management. And I think, so we're going to talk a lot about habitat management in this episode, but we're going to talk about some of the history stuff too history stuff as well, because I think that is some really cool history around habitat management uh, for wildlife. Yeah. So we do, we did find in preparation again, let's like all the disclaimers, definitely not the anthropologist like at all. We're 
trained how to count animals, basically, um, it, as wildlife biologists today. But we did find some research, so some written history. We, of course, don't have the, like, prehistoric stuff that I'm really arguing, like, that we need to be able to assert that wildlife habitat management is the oldest profession. Uh, so, fine. Okay, that's perhaps out of our league, but it's definitely an old profession. And so, some examples from this. We... Um, I was reading about this Mesolithic period, which is apparently a period that they talk about in Europe from 15,000 to 5,000 years ago, like in that window. And I found this book um, or a book chapter. It was called People, Land and Time, a historical introduction to the relationships between those people. Uh, and there was a quote in there that I liked. It said, all the findings by paleoecologists suggest that management of the ecology of the uplands was taking place at a small scale, a local scale during the later Mesolithic. So this is like at at least 5,000 years ago and probably uh, and you know up to 15,000 years ago. And then this goes on to say deer were encouraged to visit certain places within the oak forest by provision of leaf fodder which resulted in some canopy lightning. The production of edges and openings away from natural margins was carried out by ring barking rather than fire. So ring barking, I think that's girdling, what we call girdling, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in an episode later. But so I love this example from this text that I, I don't found it on Google uh, that talked about uh, 5,000 years ago, people manipulating oak forests to create more sunlight, to hit the ground, to change the behavior of, in this case, red deer, uh, in Europe to make them better hunters. Well, Adam, you beat me. You, I think you beat me by probably several thousand years. By on, several thousand years. I was like, what I could find. I think that's going to be pretty hard to beat. Okay. What do you have? So you win today. You win the, win the round today. Uh, the, the latest one I could find of truly intentional habitat management for, um, wildlife was, um, dating back to the era of Kublai Khan in the 13th century. And this is written about in a book that we'll talk about later, but also found some other um, references to it. And it actually comes from Marco Polo's expeditions um, with Kublai Khan and his empire. And it talks about um, Kublai Khan manipulating food and cover for partridges. Um, he would plant certain things, I, I don't remember exactly what it was that he was planting, maybe millet or, or milo yeah, I think or in game, game management, Leopold's book. I think it's like grains. Yeah. Some sort of grain, but he, he planted them in the Valley and they, they planted them for the specific purpose of attracting and managing these partridges. And then they would actually um, use falcons to hunt them. So that was the earliest reference that I could find um, in the, in the, at least in kind of the European Asian history about intentional habitat management for wildlife. Yeah. It's literally a 13th century food plot for, for game birds. Like we do that in Iowa right now for pheasants, which honestly, I don't know, it might actually be the same bird, but yeah, upland game birds. I read that in game management too. And there's a quote in there that I liked uh, it was from Marco Polo too. So we were looking at the same thing. So near to this city is a valley frequented by a great number of partridges and quail for, for whose food, the great Khan causes millet and other grains suitable to such birds to be sown along the sides of it every season and give strict command that no person shall dare reap the seed in order that the birds may not be want in nourishment. I love that. That is that is some serious 13th century uh, wildlife habitat management uh, going on in Asia there. That's a pretty cool example. So we got Kublai Khan in the 13th century. And then when I looked at and did a lot of research, there's really scant evidence for much more habitat management um, going on in Europe until several centuries yeah, like later, the, right? The, like scientific forestry and things. I... I kind of got that feeling too, as far as Europe, uh, you know, and we were both looking at game management and like Leopold's writings, but there's some other stuff. And it seems like a lot of what we would today call wildlife management had to do with just like restricting take. And so there's like 
quotes you know in the bible about like leaving bird nests and like the time the time of year that things are harvested and then we know that there were like a decent number of rules in europe about limiting take but we don't know a lot about manipulating environments it was more just like when you could and couldn't couldn't hunt things which of course is wildlife management but not what we're interested in which is wildlife habitat management uh so yeah so we've got we've got that like the manipulations of the forest in that mesolithic period we've got the uh example of the kublai khan um planting food plots in the 13th century i found another one um oh so now let's jump over to this hemisphere uh we were kind of trying to look for some other examples and i was trying to make sense out of some of the things they talk about with the mayan cultures you know the mayan cultures were known for manipulating water um around there where they lived um and i found this one article by this anthropologist in michigan that ar argued that some of that water manipulation may have been related to the harvesting of wild game um specifically like waterfowl and then even like aquatic insects that they would have maybe maybe been like sort of cultivating and so i don't know i'm a duck guy and so i really really wanted to find like an example of like what we today call moist soil management going on like in these like hundreds of years ago before what we would call the science of moist soil management came along uh in the, in the 20th century i'm not a, i don't know that i could settle it with the mayan thing but I, I it seems it seems probable that all that water level manipulation that they were doing something that we today recognize as like sort of wetland manipulating aquatic ecosystems to elicit a certain response with wildlife like waterfowl um, or even aquatic organisms. And it certainly was probably an, maybe if it wasn't intentional, it was certainly an unintentional. Yeah, and that's kind of, of my right? whole so thing with all this is like these people were living off the land. I mean, people of course have been living off the land forever. Um, and they had to notice these kind of manipulations and how wildlife responded. And you think they, they probably built that, um, into their cultures and into their communities. Um, I bet there were people like you and me in all these cultures here that were a little bit more wired to notice what was going on in the natural communities, uh, and doing some of these manipulations and enjoying the ducks or whatever that, uh, responded in kind. Yeah. And I'm glad we came over to, uh, North America now. And I think, um, this is, this is some of my favorite kind of history thinking back about wildlife, um, and the interrelationship between wildlife and humans in North America. And I said that the farthest thing I could find was Kublai Khan in the 13th century. Well, that really applies to Europe. If you look back at some of the history of Native Americans here in North America, you find lots and lots and lots of evidence that Native Americans were using tools to manage ecosystems for various wildlife species. And the case in point is fire. So as soon as Native Americans made it to North America, they brought with them fire and they were managing the landscape using fire. Um, and so for centuries, thousands of years, even, um, Native Americans were probably using fire for a variety of purposes and I actually found a paper that talked about Native Americans using fire in North America for over 70 reasons, which is really cool to think about. Um, and some of the main reasons were, were related to habitat management for wildlife and whether that's burning grasslands to improve forage for bison to, and to attract bison for hunting and, and those kind of purposes to, setting low intensity fires in hardwoods to encourage food and, and forage for deer, you know, and elk and things that they wanted to hunt. Um, even using fire as a way to help them collect uh, acorns and such like that. So it sounds like, you know, certainly there was intentional use of these habitat management tools to manipulate the ecosystem and the environment to encourage certain yeah, wildlife. That's species. really cool. And I, I think it's, important to remember that that uh human and landscape interaction played out in on this continent for as you said thousands of years and of course when things play out for that long of a time frame um organisms adapt the people adapted to uh the use of those tools for 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 food or for 
uh, social reasons or for hunting um, or the diversity of reasons that they used uh, fire for, but then also the plants adapted. So we find many, we'll talk about this, many plants in North America are fire dependent because they knew that those fires were coming lit uh, by people. And then of course lit by natural sources like fire uh, or excuse me, like lightning um, and those plants adapted to it. And that's, so it's a really important wildlife habitat management thing. Now would be a good time to plug another podcast in the Natural Resource University Podcast Network. We'd be remiss to not mention there's a whole Natural Resources University podcast called Fire University. That's where you can really get a lot of information about this. But uh, it's cool to think about fire as a habitat management tool that people have been using on this continent forever, for a really long time, basically as long as there have been people on this continent. Yeah, I think it's, you know, if you want to talk about the um, fire is, is really kind of the first habitat management tool, right? And so it was one of the first ones that we are able to use. And one of the cool things that I always think about when it comes to um, habitat management for wildlife in North America is the fact that the tall grass prairie, right? It, the tall grass prairie is a tall grass prairie for several different reasons, but, but some of the main drivers of it being a prairie is grazing by bison and then fire right so those are two pretty big drivers of 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 creating the tall grass prairie now you can throw in things like soil and throw in um precipitation and climate and those certainly aren't lesser factors but it's really cool to think that without fire and without the interaction of fire and grazing you wouldn't necessarily have um, a tall grass prairie it'd probably be more a forested environment if you look back in historical records and papers and things a lot of those fires probably weren't lightning just based on the time of year that they were burning so what's the other source of fire besides lightning it's usually yeah, that's humans really cool so yeah for yeah as long as there have been people here there have been people managing habitat here and as long as there has been habitat manipulated here people have been modifying uh the trajectory of ecosystems and so that's where we wanted to go next in our uh, discussion today and introducing this idea of habitat management. We wanted to define a term. And so Jared, you've got us going well down this road. So I decided to, to push us into the next segment of the, of the episode and talk about defining this term succession, because you just talked about how bison and fire were two primary disturbances in the tall grass prairie ecosystem. And so what we talk about in wildlife habitat education and wildlife habitat management is that those disturbances are manipulating a natural process that we call succession. So what do we mean when we say succession? Succession is, is a really important concept to understand when we talk about habitat and habitat management. And what it boils down to is succession, plant succession is just the orderly change in plant communities over time. Yeah. And it occurs basically in every ecosystem in North America. I guess I don't, I can't think of any exception to an ecosystem that isn't sort of in, in this constant orderly change, um, waiting for the next disturbance to modify that progression in some way. Um, I know, so we both went to Purdue, so we're going to get the Midwestern bias here, but for our undergrad, but I remember as an undergraduate going up to the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, and that's where the idea of succession uh, sort of in, in Western science was, was pioneered. And that was where they were finding sand blowing up from the lake, creating bare sediment, and then plant communities predictably transitioning through time, starting on that blank slate, that freshly blown sand, going into annual plant communities that are sort of resistant to these really rugged environments and like this tough ecosystem that's created from uh, a sediment without a lot of organic matter or that hasn't been around and is disturbance prone. Uh, and then once those annual plants are there for a little while, some what we call colonizers or early successional plants would come in. And then of course, through time, those plants would be replaced by later successional plant species. And eventually in that ecosystem, it would uh, have transitioned into a forested environment if it was far enough from the lake or wasn't prone to uh, an additional disturbance like uh, fire or grazing. And that's what we mean by that orderly transition is that you just 
can kind of, if you know a little bit about an ecosystem, you can kind of predict what's going to happen when some sort of disturbance happens, depending on its severity, and then where that ecosystem is going to end up in the absence of disturbance, say over some longer, uh, multiple years or even uh, decades or centuries uh, time frame. To me, the easiest way to think about plant succession is to picture a crop field. So a soybean field or corn field, and we've all seen them. If you've ever driven through the Midwest or Eastern United States, you've seen a corn field or a soybean field. And so picture that, that crop field and picture yourself driving by it, you know, every day or every month for the next 20 years. Right. And if someone was to stop farming it and stop planting annual crops in there, that field isn't just going to lay barren yeah. and nothing going to be there for the next 40 years. It's going to, go through a change in plant communities over time. It's going to start with those annual weeds, things like foxtail and ragweed and pigweed. And then you're going to start seeing some perennial plants, maybe some native grasses, um, different perennial plants like asters and, and goldenrod. And then you're going to start seeing things like um, little woody plants and shrubs come in, blackberry and sumac and all of those then you're going to transition into getting some trees. So within six to seven years of, of someone stopping farming that field, it's going to be a field that's dominated by shrubs and little trees and things like cottonwoods and tulip poplars and depending on where you are. And then you're going to end up with uh, eventually a forest in the next 20, 30 years, depending on where you are. And that's going to be probably in, in my neck of the woods and, and Adam's neck of the woods, that's going to be primarily probably um, an oak forest or a hickory, you know, there's going to be hickories in there as well. And that's going to persist for decades until you eventually get into what we'd call the last successional stage in this area, which is going to be things like a beach, beach maple forest. So um, as you were doing that, I was thinking like, yeah, not quite in Iowa. Like it's it, so a point to make here is like you said, I think it's like seven to eight years, it would all be shrubs. And I was like, eh, probably not in Iowa. We're dry enough that it takes like 10, 15 years until we start to have real problems with woody encroachment. And then, you know, so, so that's a point. So yes, that you just described a succession, what we would call kind of a old field succession model for Indiana. And that's certainly how I remember that. And, and our systems would be very similar, but out here, but because of the environmental conditions and the soil conditions, we have just a couple hundred miles to the west in Iowa, um, our succession would be a little bit different. Uh, but still, sticking to this same idea of a predictable transition between plant communities depending on uh, the inter introduction of different disturbances. And then that plays out everywhere in all these ecosystems in North America, all these different uh, environments, depending on the environmental conditions that prevail. And those environmental conditions could be like, um, how uh, growing degree days there could be moisture conditions it could be uh the conditions in the soil um or it could be the organisms that live there and have a tendency to manipulate or not manipulate their environment all those things come together to set the course of an ecosystem and at its core wildlife habitat management is essentially an exercise in understanding those successional gradients in the ecosystem in which you're managing and understanding how the wildlife species that you're managing for or the suite of wildlife species that you're managing for select for those different successional affiliations and then we go into the stuff we talked about last week with needing to know what they need and what's limiting and and how those uh the arrangement of those features is found and that's how you start to come up with this recipe for wildlife habitat management considering how the eco the successional state of the ecosystem and how it will respond to the disturbances that you introduce. Yeah. And I think there's some really cool charts out there and we'll, we'll try to link some in the description that kind of go through those different successional stages. Um, so in here in the Eastern U S we're going to go through those five stages of annuals, perennials, woody shrubs, pioneer trees and then um, more into some of our older forests and that's going to be the same kind of five stages whether you're in north 
central Indiana where I am or whether you're down in um, central Alabama or central Georgia. Now, the, that, so that's the cool thing is it's the same kind of progression of these stages, but the plant communities are a little different, right? What species you're going to have. So we're not going to have a lot of pine trees up here in central Alabama and central Georgia. You're going to have pine forests be kind of those later um, successional stages. And wildlife are going to respond differently to each successional stage. And there's some really cool charts that go through which successional stages certain wildlife species need. And I think maybe, Adam, we should go through some of those and maybe just talk about a few species to kind of bring that point home of how wildlife and, and their habitat needs relate to succession. Yeah, so a lot of times when we talk about wildlife we'll talk about like communities of wildlife related to the successional phase so remember last week i got i think i got in trouble or i said i was going to get in trouble because i'm definitely going to say early successional habitat and you were making the point almost foreshadowing this week's discussion that early successional habitat is really almost meaningless because early successional in one ecosystem could be really different than early successional in another we could can and generally, when you're talking about early succession, you're talking about a plant community, right? So that's there's that yeah, foreshadowing. So you're talking about a plant community. And we do find species of wildlife that tend to be associated with early successional plant communities across the ecosystems where they're found. And so, sorry, listeners, two episodes in a row, we've got to talk about northern bobwhites. Uh, northern bobwhites are kind of a classic early successional species because they do like to take advantage of... Uh, disturbed areas or they like to take advantage of um, young forests like shrubby areas uh, shrubby grasslands and and then uh, forage and dust and nest in in annual plant communities or or relatively young grasslands and so northern bobwhites would generally be accepted as an early successional species and it's definitely one where you may find we're going to violate the pledge and say early successional habitat just as sort of a catch-all for northern bobwhite habitat so if, if we showed you a chart and we'll put one up so you can see it and you are looking at it um, and you're reading it left to right on the left side, you're going to have that annual plant community and then it's going to work its way all the way to the right side. We're going to have what people call climax community, which in Eastern U S is going to be mainly forested areas and Bob White are going to tend to live their life on that left side of that chart. Right? So they're going to be in those annual perennial communities getting in and really tied to those shrubby communities too. So where you have blackberries and sumac and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's a good um, point to make. And you brought up a term there, Jared, that I kind of want to explore a little bit. And that was climax. Um, that's, that is what we put on the right hand side. So if early successional or even, I think we've said pioneer species, uh, are on the far left-hand side of our successional gradient. Climax communities are on our far right-hand side of our successional gradient. And just like we find early successional wildlife species, we also find climax successional affiliation uh, wildlife species. There's one really noted example of this in North America, uh, and that's the northern spotted owl You'll remember this was a contentious endangered species in the uh, first Bush administration. I, I don't remember. The quote doesn't matter. But, you know, there was s disputes between jobs and owls. And there was all this debate about a species like the northern spotted owl that needed old forest. They needed that climax community in the Pacific Northwest where they were found. And logging operations or timber operations that set back succession uh, that created young forests or created or yeah set back succession in those pacific northwest forests were taking habitat away from the northern spotted owl because they're a climax species now the challenge in that and there's some trade-offs and we won't get into that that would be a wonderful episode to get an expert from out there uh, on the podcast in season two but uh, for our purposes we want to make this point that there is no one right ecosystem. And that's what sometimes we have challenges in um, the communication about wildlife habitat or in education about uh, natural ecosystems that sometimes people think climax is like what you're going for. It's like the best ecosystem. And what we're actually going to talk about a lot on the podcast is 
everything but climax communities. I mean, sure, there are wildlife out there in those climax communities. Of course, the northern spotted owl is a great example. But lots of times that's the exception, isn't it? It's not actually the, the where the most wildlife diversity is found. We're going to spend a lot of time trying to stop areas from getting to that climax community in a lot of cases, right? So we're spending time trying to manage for uh, areas that are in those early success, earlier successional stages. Um, and it's really interesting too, because if you think about it, you have a lot of, you have a lot of crop fields and things in the Eastern U S which are on that very, very, very far left side. And then you have a lot of, uh, you know, older forests too, especially yeah. here in Indiana, we have a lot of forests. Most of our forests are in that, 80 to 100 years old or older they're certainly not what you may constitute as old growth forest depending on how you want to define it but we're missing a lot of that kind of middle ground and that middle ground those kind of uh early successional stages all the way up to the young forests and things that's where you actually have a lot of, of diversity of different wildlife species and that's what we're missing on the landscape and so from a management standpoint from a goal standpoint habitat management aims to kind of create those those middle yep. stages. And, and we do that by manipulating succession to sort of wrap that whole thing up. We could really get into it. We could get wrapped around the axle on this discussion, but that intermediate, I call it the Goldilocks hypothesis in the education that I do. It, ecologists call it the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. And that is ecosystems that are like sort of right in the middle between a climax community and a pioneer or early successional community tend to be the most productive. I call it the Goldilocks principle, which is just like, yeah, you don't want to go too far, too far down in the climax community. You don't want to be too soft or, you know, too early in the successional affiliation. Uh, and just like you said, no matter what ecosystem you look at, especially in these environments that we look at uh, in where a lot of people live alongside the natural ecosystems, we don't find a lot in that middle ground. And so that's where we want to sort of wrap up the episode is actually talking about how do we create it? And we've used this term habitat management. And so we want to talk about what are the tools at our disposal for habitat management? That's right. So we talked about succession. We talked about some history stuff and we mentioned it several times, but, when we talk about tools, you can't talk about much else other than Aldo Leopold's 1933 book, Game Management. Yeah, so we've already talked about the introduction of that book, and it's we're not going to talk about it in every episode, but it does provide this like kind of cool, um, almost a template that we can use for introducing this idea of habitat management, because he talks in there a history of ideas for wildlife conservation or for wildlife management. And of course he does have this very Eurocentric European worldview that is kind of central in a lot of his writings, but it's useful for us thinking about what we do in wildlife conservation, wildlife management. And he talked about, there was essentially five things that people have done to manage wildlife. They've restricted hunting. We talked about that at the beginning of the podcast, like with those there was Bible verses about that. And it was real common in Europe to restrict who could and when they could harvest um, game. They did predator control. We won't talk much about that, except we eventually we'll talk about habitat management as a method to control predators. They talked about reservation of game land. So setting lands aside for game, artificial propagation. And then finally, number five was environmental controls. And Leopold wrote, and when he was listing these five ways of managing wildlife, he said, North America has reached the stage where controls of the fifth class, that environmental controls, are becoming necessary. The present game conservation movement is groping towards the realization of this fact. And I just love that quote uh, from Game Manager in 1933. He was like, yeah, People are kind of trying, finally starting to notice that we're not going to save wildlife. We're not going to restore wildlife populations in North America after all the harm that was done to them during the Industrial Revolution. We're not going to restore them by predator control. Or we're not going to restore them through artificial propagation. We're going to restore them through habitat management. Yeah, so when he says environmental controls, he's talking about habitat management. But the really cool thing and interesting thing that we've kind of discovered while we were doing this research is that if you look in the index, the term habitat, the term habitat management are included in that 1933 book by Otto Leopold. Yeah. He doesn't um, even say the word. Yeah. It doesn't even use something. the word habitat, but 
he kind of hints at it, but doesn't get to habitat. And the term he uses is game range. Yeah. But all the elements that we talked about in the first episode, like food, water, shelter, special feature, spatial arrangement, interspersion to cover. Like he talks about all those things. He's definitely talking about habitat management. It's just funny. We were, we both kind of came to this on our own. Like, wait a minute, Leopold doesn't say habitat. Um, whereas today, like you get bludgeoned with the word habitat and the word habitat management throughout a wildlife training. So it does kind of reflect, I think it's cool. He was saying the present game conservation movement is groping towards the realization that we need to manage the environment. And it's pretty funny now today, the message is very clearly like, of course, the way that you manage wildlife and wildlife habitat is through, is through habitat management or environmental controls that he was talking about but it was definitely a different time there when he was when he was thinking about this stuff so we want to use one more quote from leopold in sort of wrapping up the episode and setting the stage for all the next ones and that is about the tools to control the environment as leopold wrote about them and so the quote that we want to talk about is, is one that people may have heard of but it's this idea that Leopold's introducing um, about those environmental controls and the quote is that in the central thesis of game management is this game can be restored by the creative use of the same tools that have heretofore destroyed it. The ax, plow, cow, fire, and gun. And when we talk about all those five tools of wildlife management, those are the five tools that we talk about. And when we think about what was going on in 1933 in the the United States, there was lots of, of things going on that kind of led to that quote, right? So we had um, lots of land being converted to agriculture. That's kind of right in the middle of the Dust Bowl. We had uh, large fires in the 1870s and 80s. You had some large fires kind of in the, the central um, United States as far as areas like Wisconsin and, and such and Western fires. So you had all these kind of tools maybe working against wildlife in some aspects, but Leopold's quote, and I think there's a really important word in there and that's the creative use of these tools. So his thought was that you could take those same tools that may have been destroying habitat, the ax, cow, plow, fire, and gun. And by using them creatively, you can actually enhance habitat for a variety of wildlife species yeah except that he wasn't actually talking about habitat he was talking about game management which to us we think is basically synonymous so we're going to run with it we're this axe plow cow fire and gun uh the axe of course being forestry and forest management like you mentioned lots of forests had been cut over during the industrial revolution uh and really transformed the landscape and led to the extirpation and even uh, of many species and even extinction of some like the uh, passenger pigeon. The plow had converted the prairies and made widespread uh, reduction in grassland ecosystems and environments through row crop agriculture, drastically transformed the landscape. The cow had been introduced to the rangelands and the bison had been removed and, and uh, overgrazing was becoming a problem. Uh, fire had been mostly removed, or as you mentioned, maybe used um, uh, for the wrong purposes in some ecosystems in North America. And the gun at that time was beginning to be regulated, fortunately, uh, but had done a lot of harm, unregulated harvest had done a lot of harm to a lot of wildlife species. And so what Leopold, the, the lesson from these two quotes that we think we can take is that we needed to manipulate the environment. We needed to engage in habitat management and we needed to do it creatively, which is the word you really picked up on in there, Jared. And I really think that's a great observation is that in order for this stuff to work, it's gotta be the creative application. You can't have too much fire. You can't have too much plow. You can't have too much ax. It's gotta be the creative or judicious use of these tools to improve conditions for wildlife. An enterprise that humans have been engaged in for as long as humans have been humans. Uh, as we started, I don't know if you're letting me have that, but as we started, maybe this is the oldest profession in the world. And we're going to dig in in details into these five aspects of this oldest profession in the world uh, in the next five episodes. And this is really where the fun part happens with 
habitat management because we get a, now we get to blend the art and the science of using yeah. these tools creatively. And that's kind of what we're going to explore next episode. So we're going to have one episode dedicated to each of Aldo's five tools. And we're going to explore how those tools relate to habitat management and how we can think creatively and use those tools to create habitat for whatever wildlife species that we may be interested in. Yep. And we're going to switch it up. It's not just going to be me and Jared talking to you anymore. In the next five episodes, Jared and I are going to go out and find people uh, that are going to talk to us. And are, about who are way smarter than us. Who are way smarter than us. Uh, and they're going to talk to us about how we can creatively, how, how we have since the 1930s when Leopold wrote this, and then today, how we can creatively apply things like the axe, plow, cow, fire, and gun to have positive wildlife responses and wildlife habitat management. And that's where we're going. So join us. We're really excited to have you join us in this journey to explore these five things. Thanks for joining us here in episode two, and we'll see you next time. Habitat University is hosted by Purdue Extension and Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, and is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. The network is supported by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you liked Habitat University, subscribe and listen to the other podcasts in the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. Iowa State University and Purdue University are equal opportunity, equal access, and affirmative action institutions. Natural Resources University is funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. New episodes are released every Tuesday. For more information, follow us on our social media platforms at nr underscore university.